Uh, I'd like to introduce Karen Korematsu. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, a pleasure to, uh, to be here. I didn't know if this is going to be uh, the JACL uh, Film Fest um, because uh, I'm going to show uh, a, a short uh, trailer to my father's documentary of civil wrongs um, uh, and rights, the Fred Cormatsu story. Um, I'll just tell you briefly, uh, you know, back before iPhones, uh, in, in uh, 1990, my mother gave my brother the charge to uh, make a film about my father. Uh, she said, well, everyone else is making a film, you know, about their families, you know, like Rabbit in the Moon and some of those that came out. And so, he, you know, she said, well, why don't you? Um, and it, it turned out to be a bit more challenging because... Uh, people didn't think my brother would be objective enough to tell a true story about his father. It's a documentary. He was going to be in the director's role. So he had to take a back seat to co-producer and then met a friend who actually is a, a film documentary um, director. And so um, all along, though, you know, you can imagine the pressure because, you know, my daddy's saying, when's this film going to be done? And because he felt like he wanted something to, to leave behind as far as his legacy, uh, and, to, and to be sure that the you know, people knew about the Japanese American incarceration. Uh, he was always afraid that something like that could happen again and look where we are now. Uh, and so uh, in, we had the world premiere in San Francisco in the year 2000 and in 2002 it, recei it received two Emmys for best director and best editing. So it's an Emmy award winning film. And then several years ago, we were able to receive a grant to cut the, the documentary down from uh, 60 minutes to 24 min minutes that we include in our curriculum kits uh, that we send out to teachers free of charge. I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, but I just, you know, for some of you, some of you that, that knew, like Henry had met my father, and um, but then some of you may have along the way, uh, that, you know, to, to listen to the first person that starts speaking is my father's voice. Um, and hopefully it'll give you some idea of the type of, of, of personality that um, he was. So without further ado, oh, there he goes, of Civil Wrongs and Rights, the Fred Korematsu story. We expect the worst to happen, and the proof you notice were posted on the telephone pole. And then after that, about a week or so, you notice for the evacuation. I didn't think that government would go as far as to include American citizens to be interned without a hearing. And then later on, they changed my draft card to 4C, which is enemy Navy. Those days, if you're an Asian people, all of mine, they think you don't do it in this country. You're not an American. And, and, and I thought that was wrong. After I was arrested, and I went there and I lied on the cot and I said, Gee, jail was a lot better than this. In 1942, an ordinary American took an extraordinary stand. Fred Korematsu boldly opposed the forced internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. After being convicted for failing to report for relocation, Mr. Korematsu took his case all the way to the Supreme Court. The High Court ruled against yeah. Fred Korematsu's case represented the trial that Japanese Americans never had. This was an entire population that without evidence, without trial, without due process of any kind, were simply swept into uh, internment camps, uh, many losing their property, um, some even losing their lives. The real significance of Fred's case is that it raised, for the first time, the central issue. Was the internment itself constitutional? 
it was, I think for him, a personal shock of recognition. Who am I? Am I an American? What does it mean for me to be an American? If you look at a Fred Korematsu, you see a very ordinary man uh, who just wanted to be left alone, but who defied the United States government because he knew it was wrong. Some names of ordinary citizens stand for millions of souls. Plessy, Brown, Parks. To that distinguished list, today we add the name. So I hope um, someday you'll be able to see the full 60 minute um, version. Uh, sometimes we have it, um, we're able to have it played uh, on the PBS station for in January for Fred Korematsu Day, and then also for May for Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, and uh, so it it's always pops up at that, at that time. So for, I know for all you young people out there, what is this? Can you tell me? It's a Google Doodle. So um, on January 30th um, of this year, on my father's birthday, uh, this Google Doodle appeared. Um, actually, my brother had been working with the Google Doodle people um, secretly. We had to work in secret on the weekend uh, before this was launched, because this is Monday. Uh, the immigration ban had just been, been issued. And so uh, you know, Google Doodle has been very good about having, um, you know, recognizing people and, and, and using their platform for education. Uh, so I actually, I, I, um, I had my cell phone by my bed and, uh, and I, I use it for um, like my alarm, right? So it's, the sound's turned off, but then all of a sudden about three o'clock in the morning, West Coast time, which is like six o'clock here, because they had launched this at midnight and on, on the East Coast, my phone starts lighting up like a Christmas tree. And I'm getting all these messages and, and emails and everyone who has seen the Google Doodle uh, and, and uh, you know, all the way here from the East Coast. Um, you know, we never, you, you never take anything for granted when it comes to media because um, you can always also end up at the cutting room floor. Uh, so it was really exciting to, uh, to see this. And, and people have told me, you know, even though my father received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, you know, which is this country's highest civilian honor, uh, when you have a Google Doodle, you've made it. <laughs> and this cute uh, little four-year-old boy is my daddy. And, uh, you know, I'm, for you parents out there, I don't know if you tell your children when they're born that someday they're going to grow up to be a, an American civil rights hero. Um, but, um, I mean, certainly my grandparents didn't say that to my father, uh, but you never know. And when I talk to, you know, my age range of audience now is five years old to a hundred. Uh, and, you know, I, especially when I speak to, um, students, you know, I'm saying that you, you never know what opportunities are going to face you along the way that you have to make the decisions, uh, you know, and to stand up for your, your principles. Um, and, uh, and actually, um, when my, is, is, um, because your middle name is, is your given name Fred or was it, or is that your, because when my, my father's given name is really Toyo Sabro, uh, which is like third son. And so his first grade teacher, uh, couldn't say Toyo Sabro. And she said, well, how would you like to be called Fred? And that's how my father got his name. Uh, so, you know, what is, and I've, I've heard stories from other teacher, from other people that say, yeah, their teacher couldn't say their name, so they were given another name. A little, uh, kind of, uh, really not, not very nice. Um, my, my father, um, and his brothers were born in Oakland, California, in the San Francisco Bay Area. My father was a third son of, uh, four boys, so he was like always the odd man out, you know. He was, and he's the the, the little guy in the front with a probably hand-me-down sailor suit, uh, and 
my, uh, my grandparents, um, you know, like many of your families, uh, came over, you know, turn of the century. My, my grandfather, because, you know, the, the, the government, as, they, as, a, as we do in this country, you know, goes to the, those other countries where we want to recruit cheap labor, right? They did that to the Chinese. They did that for the Japanese. Went to the five prefectures that have, were heavily agricultural. And, um, and then re recruited them to come, you know, like my grandfather, come to the land of, you know, opportunity. And then, you know, but you'll, we'll treat you like slaves and, and discriminate you uh, against you. But my, my grandfather first went to uh, Kauai uh, and worked in the sugarcane fields uh, there. Any families have family that went to, to Kauai? Um, and, uh, uh, and, but he didn't, you know, it was such like slave labor and the conditions were horrible that he left and, and went to San Francisco. Uh, and then um, my, my grandmother was, I, and, and it really until recent years, only about 10 years ago, did I find out she was a picture bride. Uh, because I was always told that our grandparents' families knew each other. Well, that doesn't, you know, they, the families knew each other, but they didn't know each other. So um, actually when, when research was being done to, to write a book about my, my father that we discovered um, that my, my grandmother was a picture bride. And, and fortunately, when she arrived, that the picture that re she received of, of my grandfather looked like my grandfather. <laughs> because I'm sure you've heard stories, right, where the man didn't look like you know the pictures that they 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 sent over right so yeah that's a whole another you know part of the story but this is kind of that's why I do education and talk because people don't know the many many different layers um, to the incarceration and to these families and we don't want those those stories to be lost like the the oral histories we do for Den Show and across this country for libraries are so very very important um, and I'm always you know promoting promoting that. Um, but my grandfather was able to buy land before the alien land law took into effect on August 10th, 1913. Because as you know, after that time, if you were an immigrant, you couldn't buy land. Um, and it was an industrial area of, of East Oakland. Um, so he built the flower nursery and, and, and the house you know, next to it. But my, my father was just you know this all-American kid, and he went to Castlemont High School in Oakland, California, and liked to do what other kids like to do, hang out with his buddies, and he was on the track team and the swim team, and um, you know probably got into some kind of trouble as well, uh, knowing him. Um, and they liked to ride around in a car. You know, my, my father's friend had a car, so they did that. Um, but um, you know, my, my father did. Uh, experience racism, um, you know, when he was a young, young boy, young man like this. He was, you know, up until about the time of high school, my grandmother cut his hair. And one day he says, well, I, you know, I'm a big boy now. I, wanna, I want my hair cut by a real barber. So he goes into this little town called San Leandro, which is next to Oakland. It's only like three blocks away, very small, you know, town. Um, you know, mostly Caucasian people live there. And he walks into this um, barber, it's kind, you know, the kind with a candy cane pole on the outside. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember what those looked like. There was only one chair uh, in the barber shop, very small. And my dad starts walking, you know, through the door. And the barber says, hey boy, what do you want? And my dad says, well, I just want a haircut. And he said, you get out of here. You don't belong here. You go down to Chinatown, and I never want to see you again. So my father was all by himself. He didn't have any of his friends around, and he just didn't know how to take that kind of you know, treatment. And he never told his parents. And then in, in, during the summer month, um, you know, a year or so later, he delivers some flowers for my uh, grandfather in, in San Leandro, a nice, you know, friendly town. And, uh, and so he walks into a diner because it's late in the afternoon and he's hungry. So he walks into this diner, you know, the kind with the counter, the bar stools and the little cook behind it. Uh, and in my, in my dad walks in the door and the cook says, hey, what do you want? And my dad says, well, I just want something to eat. He said, you get out of here. You go down to Chinatown. And, and don't ever come back. And so, you know, what's, what's the message here? You don't look like us. You know, this is kind of what's happening even now um, to, to a Muslim and Arab and, and, and South Asians, you know, where they, where, they, where they get, you know, feel like they're rejected and, and they experience prejudice and racism. 
Um, so those kinds of experiences, you know, you start to internalize that, don't you? Uh, and even before Pearl Harbor, um, there was um, there was uh, talk of the draft, and you know this is um, my father with his um, with my grandparents in the flower nursery and his three brothers, uh, and my gra my father standing in, in front of my grandparents. And you know if I don't know for for some of your families, but what they used to do was every few years they would take photographs and they would send them back to Japan to show how well the families were doing and the businesses if they had businesses that they could show. And so they, um, fortunately, we were able, my grandfather put these photographs up in the boiler room, which is, you know, for flower nurseries, you have a boiler room with the hot water that goes into the greenhouses, right? And so he hid those. And fortunately, we, we, he got them back after the war. Um, because a lot of people, you know, burn pictures and, you know, they were lost. Um, and, and this one now is, um, and another one I'll show you is in the uh, Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Um, my, my father is the first Asian American to be in a permanent exhibit called Struggle for Justice. Now we've, we've had um, some other, um, other um, Asian Americans in, in that um, uh, exhibit. But um, my, my, um, my father's three brothers, this is Uncle High, who's kind of the closest um, you know, standing. Uh, he was the oldest one, so you know how Japanese families are, right? <laughs> you know, the flag, flag day for boys. Um, so he's like number one son, you know, he could do no wrong type of thing, shining light. Um, Uncle Harry was, was standing behind him. I called him the, the spare to the air. Uh, and my Uncle Joe was um, wearing the, the hat and he's like the, you know, the baby and, and get, gets away with, you know, not having to do the chores. Uh, and so that's really, this in, photograph is interesting because of the di dynamics that it, that it shows. But, um, you know, it's, you can see that, you know, just like a lot of the Japanese American families, their families worked very, very hard in their businesses. And then all of a sudden, they're lost, right? They're stripped away. And it's just very disheartening to think of, you know, you know what, what happened at that time. And so I always hated this picture, right? Even I even I was just in um, Long Island the last two days. I spoke to Northport Middle Schools. Uh, there's two of them. There's Northport and there's Northport East. It gets very confusing. Um, uh, and and they're and they're these are eighth graders. And I ask them what what's this photograph of? And they they can tell me it's the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, also, I spoke to high school students the, the next day, about 600 students at Stony Brook University. And, uh, and so I hated this photograph because a teacher, I, you know, I grew, my brother and I were born in Oakland, California. So after the, after the war, my parents uh, went to the San Francisco East Bay. And, uh, and so we grew up in, in, in an area that was really more um, Caucasian families, um, military families had settled there. And the teacher would show this picture and she would say, oh, this is the bombing of Pearl Harbor. This is December 7th. And the Japanese came over and, and killed all these people, you know, all these soldiers in Pearl Harbor. And that was kind of about it. And so the kids, you know, what are they going to think of me? I mean, I've, you know, I've got, there's only, there's 20, you know, there's maybe six Asian American, you know, children, students in the, well, in my high school especially, and only a few in my elementary school. And, uh, and so the kids would say, well, it's you know, your fault for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. You go back to Japan. You don't belong here. And so it got so bad, I couldn't even ride the school bus. I had to make up, I had to make up excuses you know, not to ride the school bus. And the irony is my brother, who's four years younger, had the same experience. So you know, for, for everyone, it was a very scary time you know, back in, in 41. But my father thought maybe something might happen to his parents because they weren't citizens even though they wanted to become citizens. But he thought as an American citizen, nothing would happen to him. And so, you know, this is kind of the, the start of the war effort. Um, the women were working in the factories. And then, you know, then you saw these posters where the Japanese were being de demonized. Um, and so they had to endure all that. Uh, and then, of course, these signs started going up and, uh, and up and down the West Coast. I'm an American. You know, that's you know, for our, for your families that were out on the West Coast, you know, people wanted to you know say, hey, I'm I'm loyal to America, and uh, and then they had their businesses that were impacted. 
So with the executive order 9066 being issued, um, and actually um, I have moved my office to the Presidio in San Francisco, which was the home of the Fourth Army. And so when President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, was, which was really encouraged by General Don, John DeWitt, whose Fourth Army was based at the Presidio. So it's, it's, still, it's still there. Um, and that's why I wanted to have my office there, because I, I, I wanted to, to develop a, an area that has more focus about the Japanese American incarceration. Um, but, you know, my father thought that he would be protected. But, you know, when the executive order was issued or, and the exclusion orders, all due process of law was denied, right? And that's what I tell students. With the, with the Constitution, my father thought he had, he learned about the Constitution in high school. So he thought he had rights as an American citizen. That was, that's what he was just, he couldn't believe that. You know, here he learns about the Constitution in high school, so I tell kids, you know, like, listen up, because you need to know about your rights. And, you know, it, it just, it was such a sad experience. I think of my grandmother, you know, this lovely, elegant-looking woman that, unfortunately, she died on my first birthday, so I didn't get to know her. But, you know, she's stripped of, you know, really of all her possessions and, um, you know, and worked so hard. And so my father, if you, if you heard in the, in the film, he said, um, you know, when they're showing the racetrack, you know, gee, jail was a lot better than this. Well, he, w he and his family, um, and, I mean, he was arrested first, um, about 30 days after everyone else had to report to uh, Tanferan, which was the detention assembly center in, for the San Francisco Bay Area. A lot of people down in L.A. was Santa Anita, or, you know, they were off in different fairgrounds. But, you know, that's why my father said, gee, jail was a lot better than this, because he couldn't believe after he had been arrested and he was sent there that these conditions would be so deplorable. Um, but, you know, even like um, George was talking about, you had even Department of Justice camps that were here in New York. Uh, and so I was able to share that with the, with the students that I was, you know, speaking to, to tell them that, you know, this impacted the entire United States. But, um, you know, teachers had to come in and, and they didn't realize, these kids did not realize that, you know, if you, if you were a child, you were still incarcerated. So I told them that a third of the 120,000 people that were incarcerated were like under the age of 18. You should see the reaction. It's like, oh, I said that's right. And then I tell them that if, if it happened in this day and age, they could not take their computers, they could not take their iPhones, they could not take their iPods. Boy, you should hear the bones. <laughs> you should hear the bones. I said, you couldn't even take a baseball bat because, you know, that was considered a weapon. And baseball, you know, as we know, was a big part of camps, but the, all that equipment was sent in usually later. Um, and, you know, with, you know, I was trying to explain to them with, you know, that even soldiers had, you know, they had, we, we lost people like in Manzanar, a man that got too close to the, um, to the barbed wire who could not hear, was shot and killed, right? And so finally, it took several people to be killed, you know, before they changed the policy of, you know, uh, of, of uh, not, uh, you know, shooting people. I mean, where are they going to go? That's what I said. Where are they going to go? And when I was talking to the middle school students, I saw your picture up here, which is this one here. They, this is the way they would be living, behind barbed wire. So, you know, to try to bring these experiences to students that they can understand is what, is what we're trying to do. Uh, because, you know, the inhumanity is, is really another part of this, of this story. But as I said, you know, my father was arrested. He, he avoided the, uh, the military orders uh, and, or, and disobeyed them. So he was arrested about 30 days. He was on a street corner in San Leandro. We still don't know, and he still doesn't know how any, how first the police showed up and then the MP showed up. And, uh, you know, his story was like, well, you know, the police say to him, well, have you seen the, a, a short uh, Japanese American guy? And, you know, my father goes, no, you know, it just, he had changed his name to a, a Spanish Hawaiian name called Clyde Sarah. It's like, where did you get that? <laughs> you know, really? I mean, that, how creative is that? I don't know. I think it was kind of a made up name. He had an Italian American girlfriend, not my mother, she would tell you if she were here. She would never desert my father. 
Um, and we don't know if it was her family that turned him in or what, because he was supposed to be meeting his girlfriend, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, he still doesn't, we still don't know. We, he never saw the girlfriend again, so we, we don't even know what happened. But, you know, the story of she was Italian. So, you know, obviously there is friction there already um, that people don't realize between the Italians and the Japanese and the, and the Germans. Uh, and so he, um, he, was, he was arrested, and they, they didn't know what to do with him. So they arrested him, and they kept moving him from jail to jail to jail. And then finally, he ended up in the San Francisco Federal Jail. And that's when Mr. Ernest Bessick from the American Civil Liberties Union read about my father being arrested in the newspaper. And he was looking for a test case, right? He, he said, you know, ACLU, that's unconstitutional. And so he visited my father and said, you know, would he be willing? And my dad says, yes, um, bless you. And then he said, if need be, we'll go all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, my dad thought, certainly by the time that his case gets to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would see it's unconstitutional. Well, you know, we know the end, to the end of that one. So he was really disgusted um, when it, it, you know, the decision came down as a six to three decision. So it was, but the, the three dissenting opinions are what we are talking about, especially today, right? So Justice Jackson, uh, Robert Jackson um, at that time in 44, referred to my father's case as this lies around like a loaded weapon ready for anyone to pick up and use with a plausible cause. After 9-11 in 2001, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft in the Bush administration cited Korematsu versus the United States as a possible reason to round up Arab and Muslim Americans. Even after the election, um, the, my father's case was being um, cited as a possible reason um, or ba basis for the Muslim registry. You know, then I tell kids there was a there was a Japanese American registry back in '42, right when the exclusion orders were issued. Everybody had to register, so it's not a new thing. You know, it's these 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 are not new ideas. We just keep repeating the same mistakes, and that's what we want young people to learn. Especially, I mean, obviously DC's got a long ways to go, but you know, we figure the next generation we want them to to learn this. And Justice and, and Justice Murphy. You know, so we were talking about racism. Justice Murphy, this is 1944. He says, he called this the ugly abyss of racism. This is 1944. Owen Roberts, Justice Owen Roberts said, this is unconstitutional. So, you know, with, with Hirabayashi and Yasui, those, those decisions were unanimous. That's why, you know, people hang their hat on these three dissenting opinions and why they're, re they're relevant today. So fast forward. Um, this is 1966. My father now has a crew cut. Uh, my mother, who he met in Detroit, Michigan, so as you know, towards the end of the war, even though he had a, a, pro he had a probation record, a federal prison record, he could, go, he could go east. He was getting a job, and he, met, he went to Detroit, Michigan, and that's where he, he met my mother. Um, she was born in South Carolina. She received a, a scholarship to Wayne State University in Detroit uh, to receive her master's in microbiology and worked on penicillin research. Uh, so when they decided to get married, though, they could not go back to South Carolina in 1946, and they couldn't even go back to California because those laws didn't change till 1948, the anti-racial marriage laws. Uh, so, I mean, actually the North, the, the Midwest was a, was a bit more friendly. You know, they, they were like the, Detroit, Michigan was like the land of the th a thousand churches. Instead of Starbucks on every corner, there was a church, you know, and so they had these youth groups and, um, and they brought in people that, you know, especially the, the Japanese, you know, youth that had been incarcerated invited them to, to their, their Sunday um, services. And that's, um, and that's how my mother met her first Japanese American person ever, Elma Takahashi, who then ended up to be my mother's maid of honor when my parents were married in Detroit, Michigan. And our families are still as close um, as they were. So I'm 16 years old uh, in this photo, and uh, it's, um, uh, sorry? Chubby. Chubby. This is my husband. This is the, 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 the heckler over here. <laughs> the heckler over here is my husband, Donald Haig. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm 16 years old in high school, 
And I'm, um, after a long summer of water skiing, because someone says, oh, you look like you're Native American Indian. I said, well, no, I'm half Japanese American. Um, and, uh, and my mother is you know, Scottish, Irish, uh, and German. That was another combination. So, uh, but I'm studying U.S. history you know, in, in, as, a, as a junior. And the assignment that our teacher um, has, has given to each student is to read this little paperback book. It's called Concentration Camps USA. And my friend, Maya um, Okada, her last name is Okada. Um, and we had been friends since we were like, yeah, because you never know. My, uh, we've been friends since we were five years old. We used to push our baby buggies across the field because uh, her family had a flower nursery. And she gets up in front of, her cl of the class uh, and her paperback book is called Concentration Camps USA. And then she's talking about the Japanese American internment. You know, that's what they referred to it back then. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I never had heard that before. What's that about? And then she goes on to explain this time in history and all these conditions. And I'm going, how come no one has told me about this? Um, and then she says, but there's this one man who um, avoided uh, the military orders, and it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. <laughs> oh, that's my name. And I have 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me, and I'm shrugging my shoulders thinking that it's some black sheep of the family. You know, I, I thought maybe it was my, my uncle High, the firstborn, because he didn't turn out to be such a shining light after all. And my grandfather had a brother that worked in the flower nursery business with him before uh, Pearl Harbor and just kind of somehow disappeared. So it's the last class of the day, fortunately, and I said to my friend Maya, I said, well, what's this about? And she says, well, this is about your dad. I said, no way. Somebody would have told me. Um, I said, why didn't you tell me before? And she said, well, I thought you knew. You know, no one talks to anybody. And, and so I, you know, this is the days of, of even before I, you know, cell phones, right? So I'm trying to get to a pay phone to go call my mother. I mean, you know, I'm talking to young kids, you know, <laughs> the other last two days, you know what a pay phone looks like? I mean, you know, it was only 10 cents back in those days to call. But my mother was one of these yak, 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 always on the phone, you know, and she it was busy. So I, I ran home and I, you know, burst through the door and I told her, you know, what, what Maya had, had talked about that day and she says, um, yes, um, this is about your father. Well, when were you going to tell me? Well, when you got older. I am older. Well, when you're about ready to go to college. I'm about ready to go to college. Uh, and so and then I get the standard answer, well, you'll have to wait until your father gets home and you ask him. Great. So it's a long time until 8 o'clock at night. You know, it's 3.30 in the afternoon. And I come down and I, you know, I could get excited and jump up and down from my mother, but you know, my, my father, I didn't do that. Um, and he, and so I told him what, what I had learned that day, and he said, it happened a long time ago, and what he did he thought was right, and the government was wrong. That clear and simple. And I could see this hurt going over his face, and I was so close to my daddy, I couldn't ask him any more questions. So, but I did ask him about, about that period in time, but I asked him, I said, can you vote? Because voting was always very important to my parents. So I hear you're having an election here of governors, or right? So I told the kids, I said, be sure to register to vote when you can, but go home and ask your parents, are they registered to vote? Have them, you know, remind them to go vote because, you know, we, we look at the results last time. We, we take it for granted. So it's, it's a, you know, I travel to different parts of the world and China doesn't have that, you know, right. So we got to step it up here and hopefully the next generation will, will do that as well. Um, uh, so the irony to this story is my younger brother, uh, Ken, found out the same way about my father's Supreme Court case in high school. So we didn't have dinner talk, obviously. Uh, and, uh, and we didn't compare notes until later on. Cause, and I never spoke to my father again about this until his case was reopened in 1983. So fast forward 
This is the press conference um, in January 1983 announcing to the world that they found the evidence in Washington, D.C. that proved that there was no military necessity for the Japanese Americans to be incarcerated. And Peter Irons, Professor Peter Irons and Aiko Hirsuk Yoshinaga are the ones that found the evidence. Um, and then they recruited um, uh, the legal team. These are all Japanese Americans. Actually, this is um, right here. That's um, Lorraine, um, or that's Lorraine Bonai, that's Catherine Bonai's um, sister. Uh, and, uh, and so, but my, the first time we met the legal team at, at my parents' house, my dad turns to Peter Irons and he said, gee, these kids look like high school kids. Are you sure you, they know what they're doing? And, and Peter says, yes, Fred, you know, they're really, you know, the best. Because they had to work in secret. So Peter brought this information, you know, got, was persuaded my father to, to reopen his case along with, with Gordon and men. And, uh, and so they created the quorum nobis. You know, quorum nobis means an error has been made before us. Um, an error has been made before the court. That's the, the, the kind of the Latin. Um, it's a little known procedure. So you have to have served your sentence in order to be able to address this to the court. And, uh, uh, and so, um, you know, they, they decided that they would have like three bites of the apple. So they would have, you know, my father in San Francisco, Gordon Hirabayashi in Seattle, and men in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, and so that's, they, but the, all the three um, Quorum Nobis teams collaborated together with all this, with all this evidence. Uh, and so this is, this is announcing that they're going to be, you know, reopening this case. Um, and you know, uh, and so in November 10th, um, 1983, um, Marilyn Hall Patel, Judge Marilyn Hall Patel, um, issued her actually issued her decision from the bench, um, as Don Tamaki said in in the film. You know, it was the day in court for all Japanese Americans. You know that they never had that chance to really you know you know have that before. So it was it was just you know amazing that it was a a, a packed courtroom. But, you know, my father never um, wanted, you, you know, he, he not only wanted to vindicate himself, but, you know, when he lost the Supreme Court case, he, he felt, you know, the responsibility, like he let down his own Japanese American community. Now, you have to know that from day one, when my father entered into Tan Foran Detention Assembly Center, he was vilified and ostracized from his own Japanese American community. Nobody wanted anything to do with him because they thought some harm might come to them if they associated, you know, with, with my father. You know, the JACL's position at that time was he was a dissenter, right, as many others, and the, and the no-nos, so therefore they were also ostracized from the Japanese-American community and really stigmatized for taking their position. Um, but my father, the thing was is that he was never bitter or angry. You know, he never blamed anybody. He just just really believed in his principles. And he, you know, you talk about sometimes these things take a while, like maybe Fred Korematsu Day for New York. Um, it, it's, it's like he waited almost 40 years for justice. But until his case was reopened, I never knew that he never gave up hope that someday he could reopen up his case. That's amazing that he never gave up hope for almost 40 years. He shared that with my mother, but he never told his children. Um, so he helped also with redress and reparations. Um, he was part of NCRR. He and my mother, you know, went to Washington, D.C. several times. And so, you know, his message when he was talking to, to people as when he crisscrossed the country is, you know, to support your elect, you know, either run for office because that's how we get a diversity from our different communities is to, is to run for office. If you don't want to run for office, at least support people, especially in your community, that, that do want to run for office and, and support them because that's how we make a difference. You know, that's how our elected officials, because he was saying that if we had not had, you know, um, Congressman Bob Matsui and Sparks Matsunaga from Hawaii and Senator Inouye and, you know, some of these other people that were in Congress, that 
we might not have been able to have the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 signed. And, w and he's holding up one of the letters, as you showed before, that was the apology. Because, you know, as you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the money. You have, to get, you have to throw money at the government in order to get their attention. But it was the apology because everybody had that stigma all those years. And then also the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund was created. We wanted that to try to change some of the, the uh, textbooks. Unfortunately, that money is kind of dried up, but now in California, we do through a, um, a Chinese American um, uh, assembly member has put money in, in, into the California budget for education, but for our civil liberties public education projects. And so we're, we're continuing on with, with through the, the Core Monsu Institute in, in supporting that as well. Um, you know, as I tell um, young people, I said this is not a Photoshop picture. Um, my father and Rosa Parks did meet and, uh, in San Francisco, and she was just a, a gentle, you know, humble, you know, kind person like my father. You know, you can, you can, you know, you can, it, your, their smiles reveal their hearts and their personality. Um, I don't know who was more excited to meet each other, um, quite frankly. But this is what we're doing through the Korematsu Institute, is to tie in the stories of these American civil rights heroes. You know, we just can't work in silos anymore. And at the end of the day, what we want students to learn is that they're Americans. No matter what your ethnic ethnicity is, we are Americans and we need to support each other and work cross communities if we're going to make a difference in this country. So as you see, my father received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, and and the, um, the, the interesting story, do I still have time to tell an interesting story? OK. All right. So this is, this is um, uh, in, in December 1997, the telephone rings at my parents' house, and my dad answers the phone. Now, daddy never answered the phone. It's always my mother, you know, yak, yak, yak. My daddy answers the phone. It's early in the morning. My mother's still asleep. And at, on the other end of the line, a voice says, Mr. Korematsu, yes. Well, Mr. Mr. Korematsu, this is the White House. OK. Well, Mr. Korematsu, are you well? Now they just woke him up. Yes. Well, Mr. Korematsu, uh, President Clinton would like to give you the Presidential Medal of Freedom. OK. Uh, well, Mr. Korematsu, can you come to the White House on January 15th of next month? Uh, 1998, and my, my dad says, I don't know, you'll have to speak to my wife, and hands the phone to my mother, who doesn't believe this guy, because it's like candid camera, if you ever remember that kind of, you know, program. She thinks, you know, this is a joke, right? So she grills this guy, I mean, really, I think grills this poor aide for like an hour, and so finally, he, you know, she says, okay, well, he, and the aide says, well, M Mrs. Korematsu, you look into your f airline flights to Washington, D.C., and your hotel, and we'll call you back next week with more, with more details. And so, you know, then he, then, but you can't tell anybody. So I tell kids, you know, if you, if you, if you think that you're going to, you know, you want to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom, you better save your dollars, you know. And because uh, there, there was no White House official letter that came before that. You would think so, right? Uh, so the, the White House, another White House aide, because I don't think the same one wanted to talk to my mother again, um, <laughs> called back and said, well, Mrs. Korematsu, have you, you know, purchased your airline tickets and which hotel are you staying? This is the following week. Um, and, you know, because she's told my brother and I, and we're, you know, kind of on our way over there. And, and, uh, uh, and my mother says, well, aren't you at least going to be sending an airline ticket for my husband and um, a hot pay for the hotel room? Uh, no, Mrs. Korematsu, you have to pay for your own expenses. So I tell kids, especially on the Midwest, East Coast, or West Coast, you know, start saving your dollars now if you want the Presidential Medal of Freedom, because you've got to pay for your own expenses. Uh, so, uh, you know, so my mother says, well, I'll have to talk to my husband and, you know, I'll call you back. And then my brother and I, you know, walk into the, you know, burst into the door and, uh, and we're hearing what's going on. And so, you know, my mother and father are talking about this and my, my daddy says to my mother, uh, well, Catherine, just, just call back the White House. Uh, tell them to send the medal to me in the mail because it's going to be too expensive to get there. 
Because, you know, my father had housing discriminations as well. And so, you know, and employment discrimination, he didn't have a pension. You know, there's nothing like that. Couldn't even work for the government, right? He tried to get a real estate license, and he was denied that. He wanted to help people that had been discriminated against, you know, in housing. But he couldn't even have a... Um, uh, uh, a real estate license when he wanted it, you know, when I was a teenager. So, um, so, but he, you know, he he received all these honors um, on behalf of of all the Japanese and Japanese Americans that were incarcerated. That's just the, you know, that's just the way he was. Um, but we did get there, is the um, the answer to that, and uh, uh, it was a wonderful, you know, ceremony. But you never know what's going to happen um, to someone's uh, legacy after they pass away. Schools started to be named after my father. There's three here. There's another fourth one now um, in San Francisco and up at Bay Area and up into Sacramento. Uh, and then, as um, George said, in 2010, Governor Schwarzenegger signed the legislative bill for Fred Korematsu Day so, uh, of civil liberties in the Constitution. And it's about our civil liberties and the Constitution. That's the point. That's the emphasis. Yes, it's a wonderful honor, and, and there aren't, you know, who out there is, is of, of at least people know of uh, that um, is Asian American. You know, we have Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez, but where's the Asian American that, that you know, represents, um, you know, our community and the Amemsa community um, and, and the un underserved? And so that's, you know, the, 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 the emphasis. Um, and so, um, now we have Fred Cuomo Day in Hawaii, Virginia, and Florida, um, and we um, uh, created uh, curriculum kits uh, that we send out to teachers free of charge. So I've worked with the New York Council of Social Studies. Um, we have now impacted all 50 states with our curriculum kits and 12 countries because other countries look at the Japanese American incarceration as a human rights violation. We just send a kit off to Nigeria. One to Colombia, Sri Lanka, you know, several uh, in Asia, uh, and even Japan. So that's that's what you know. That's the the education that we're trying to 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 push, um, and to be sure that the next generation knows about uh, this time in history, so we don't keep making the, the same mistakes. Um, and now we're into our second edition. My friend Kath here, back there, wave your hand. Don't be shy. Helped um, with the second edition, where, where we had a teachers' writing institute in um, in in uh, the Bay Area, and we're working on the uh, the second edition of our curriculum kit uh, to get ready to send out in November. And these are all the different pieces that are in in the kit. But that's what we do for fundraising. So they cost us about twenty five dollars each. But I'm bound and determined to make sure that they and that most of that's postage. Let me tell you, it's, you know, U.S. mail. I mean. I, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing with their money, but um, that's another story. But we, you know, we're bound and determined to make sure that this gets into teachers' hands free of charge because we know that, you know, education budgets are getting cut. Uh, and you know, I've, I've, you know, when I've spoken to the New York Council for Social Studies and presented to them, you know, may all these teachers sign up. This year we have, I work now with the National Council for Social Studies. These conferences move around the country. I've been working with them for, since 2012, either in a workshop or a feature presentation. So this year it's in San Francisco and they asked me to be the co-chair for this. Um, there's about 6,000 teachers that come to San Francisco. And we, you know, and this is the kind of thing that we, you know, make sure that teachers are aware of. Um, and even in, you know, we have um, elementary, middle school, and high school lesson plans. So if you know teachers, they can go to the KoromatsuInstitute.org website and sign up for curriculum kits free of charge. And I don't care if they are private, public, or charter. I don't care if they teach physical education. It's, you know, the, it's all about social justice at the end of the day. And there's something in there for everyone that teachers can use so that we are, make sure that, you know, our story here is, is continued on. Um, so speaking of um, Catherine Bonai, her, her, her uh, sister, um, Lorraine, that I pointed out, um, wrote a book last year called Enduring Conviction. Uh, the Fred Cormatsu story, and, and that's, um, that book came out last year, so we're very uh, proud of that. And we have the Fred T. Cormatsu Center for Law and Equality at Seattle University School of Law. 
uh, and they are kind of the academia, also they work on the amicus brief. So I, as in advocacy, sign on you know, with the immigration, uh, with the Muslim immigration travel ban, with, you know, um, with the, um, uh, the Ninth Circuit, the Hawaii versus Trump, and um, IRAP uh, versus Trump with the Fourth Circuit. We signed, I signed on, as did um, the children of um, Gordon and Mann, uh, amicus brief that went to the Supreme Court. We were supposed, I was supposed to be in the Supreme Court on, on Tuesday the 10th, but because the president issued another, another travel, travel ban, that kind of made it moot. In other words, they kind of took it off the docket. So we have to start all over again in, in trying to um, have the Supreme Court look at this, um, of, of this, you know, kind of injustice. And, and really, you know, the, the, you know, I say racial profiling was wrong in 1942, and racial and religious profiling is wrong now. And here we are 75 years later, and how, how far have we come? So these are the kinds of issues, the education that I, uh, that I keep um, you know, pushing. And uh, you know, this is my father's um, other photograph that's in the National Portrait Gallery in the um, uh, Smithsonian. We, um, through the Korematsu Institute, we issued a, a calendar this year because it's the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. If you haven't been, if you go to DC, go to the um, um, American History Museum, there's an exhibit there that's temporary. It's only gonna go until next year. Uh, but with the, the Korematsu Institute um, also consulted on that, uh, on that uh, museum exhibit. And also there's one out in, in San Francisco in the Presidio, in the Officers Club. So that's what we do with, with education, is to also be consultants um, regarding this, and the, Nash, and the um, Ninth Circuit Judicial Historical Society. Um, so this is you know, um, you know, Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. And you know, it represents all of us, uh, and is a reminder that we, you know, we need to keep fighting, obviously, for our civil liberties and the Constitution. Um, you know, our, our, our work through the Korematsu Institute is, is edu education to ad advance racial equity, social justice, and human rights for all. And I, 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 I'm the executive director now, but so my number one job is like getting up and worrying about fundraising. I'm going to let somebody else do that maybe in a few years' time. But, you know, God willing, I'll be speaking the rest of my life about, like my father because he kept speaking five months before he passed away at the age of 86. He crossed this country um, to be sure that the lessons of history were, you know, hopefully being learned. Uh, and, uh, and he gave me the charge to carry on with, with education five months before he passed away. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not the attorney, but, you know, I'll try. <laughs> um, and so that's why I'm here, and I speak to students. But if, if my father were here, he would, you know, he would say, you know, to remember to stand up for what is right, and as I tell students especially, you know, protest, but not with violence. Otherwise, they won't listen to you. But don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you.